Joshua chapter 4 And it came to pass, when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man, and command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men, whom he had prepared of the children of Israel, out of every tribe a man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them, that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones out of the midst of Jordan, as the Lord spake unto Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel and carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged, and laid them down there. And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests which bear the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there unto this day. For the priests which bear the Ark stood in the midst of Jordan, until everything was finished, that the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto the people, according to all that Moses commanded Joshua, and the people hasted and passed over. And it came to pass, when all the people were clean passed over, that the ark of the Lord passed over, and the priests, in the presence of the people, and the children of Reuben, and the children of Gad, and half the tribe of Mezusah, passed over, armed before the children of Israel, and Moses spake unto them. About forty thousand prepared for war, passed over before the Lord unto battle, to the plains of Jericho. On that day the Lord magnified Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him, as they feared Moses all the days of his life. And the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Command the priests that bear the ark of the testimony, that they come up out of Jordan. Joshua therefore commanded the priests, saying, Come ye up out of Jordan. And it came to pass, when the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord were come out, were come out of the midst of Jordan, and the soles of the priest's feet were lifted unto the dry land, but the waters of Jordan were turned unto their place, and flowed over all his banks as they did before. And the people came up out of Jordan on the tenth day of the first month, and encamped in Galgal, in the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, when your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then, sh then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you, until ye were passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty that you might fear the Lord, your God, forever. Amen. Thank you, brother. All right, Joshua chapter 4. We'll just get right into the study. It begins in verse 1. It says, And it came to pass. There's that lovely five words there again. And it came to pass. When all the people were clean, passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying... So we know in the previous chapter, the Lord had given Joshua commands, and Joshua then carried forth the commands. The previous verse of the previous chapter says, And the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan, and all the Israelites passed over on dry land until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. And here, it just reiterates that and says, Look, the people passed 
clean over Jordan. What I believe this is an indication of is that they finished the task that God had given them in stepping in with the soles of their feet, standing firm on dry ground as the water built up upon a heap on either side of them. They clean past over that. They finished the task that the Lord said. And then it says the Lord spake unto Joshua saying, Sometimes we need to finish a task that God has given us before he's going to go and speak unto us again. I believe the same is true with respect to studying of the word of God. Sometimes God gives us this great revelation and we think to ourselves, wow, that is wonderful. Wow, that is life changing. Wow, I should really apply this to my life. But then we leave off doing that thing. And so... We go to our Bible reading, and we're studying, we're studying, and studying. We're just not getting that same impact. We're not getting that same feeling and sense of God literally speaking to us from His Word. And we wonder, what's going on? Yesterday's study was so wonderful. I felt God gave me a great insight and a great instruction. Then you think to yourself, huh, did I actually do what God said? And sometimes God wants you to do what He has revealed to you first before He's going to speak into you a second time. Even as we see that little bit play out here. They finished the task, then God spake to Joshua again. There was no need for God to speak to him prior to this. Why? Because he'd already told him what to do. Joshua, go do this thing. When it was done, God speaks again, and he gives him the next test. Again, same thing is true with our revelation. God gives us commands, he gives us revelation in the scriptures. Apply that before you expect God to speak to you again in the exact same way, or even in a greater way. And that's what you see with respect to Joshua and his conquering. Things just keep getting better for them as they follow forward in obedience. Verse 2, Joshua chapter 4, it says, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe, a man. This is the same thing that was said in the previous chapter in verse 12. Now therefore take you twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe, a man. And I believe this actually connects itself too with Joshua chapter 1. And in verse 6, the original charge to Joshua, which was this, Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people thou shalt divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. You can see this play out at several times in the next few chapters and in ones previous. The land is being divided. The people are being divided. Heads of each of these tribes are being called for to do a specific task. Perhaps it will be in fulfillment of Joshua's ultimate task, which is to divide the land amongst them as the heads and their people underneath them. The original then task to Joshua was to divide the land, and now these 12 men again are called out, perhaps in preparation of exactly what he is to one day do. Verse 3, we continue on, and he says, Of these 12, God commands, Take you these 12 men out of every tribe. And he says, And command ye them, verse 3, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, Twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. So he says, go to where the priest stood firm. Take a stone from there and bring it with you. I believe perhaps this stone or this rock or this adamant that was picked up from where the feet, the feet were is a symbol. And God's going to show us what this is a symbol of, but... God doesn't just have men go through activities just to keep them busy. There's a specific reason why he wants them to do this. This stone, then, I believe, is a symbol of those very firm feet that were placed there. Remember, every tribe had a man standing there firm. The priest had, uh, were standing, no, sorry, the priests were standing there firm, and out of that, he says, take you a twelve, a stone for every man in particular, every tribe in particular. Take these home with you. He says, carry these over with you at the end of that verse and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. So again, God is giving them an illustration. He's about to give them a lesson. The important thing that I just see practically here is that when God is about to give you a lesson, give you a sign, give you a symbol of what just took place. And remember, we talked about how the priests, when they stood firm, it was like they had finished their work. They were about to stand and see the salvation of God. God said, go this far and then stand and I'll do the rest. 
And that's the thing that we need to do in our lives sometimes is not just always be so busy, but go so far as God has commanded us and then just stand and wait for him to do a work in our lives. And so the symbol then is that a rock would be taken from that very place that they had stood and brought home with them. So why not take the lessons that you learn and the symbols that you learn home with you every day as, as God, I believe, here is, is showing us in, in kind of a type and kind of a picture. The lesson was standing firm. Take an item from that. Take a lesson from that. Take a picture from that. Bring it home with you. Take a part of the sermon that's preached today and every Sunday. Take that home with you. Even if it's just one little pebble from what is said here from the Word of God, take that home with you. Bring it back to the place where you lodge with you. And you'll benefit from that. So you can take your Bible and go to Exodus chapter 14, keeping your finger in Joshua chapter 4. Exodus chapter 14. I'm going to talk briefly to the image that has transpired here that has taken place about standing and seeing God work. And this is exactly what the priests did. They walked so far and God said, stand firm. When you stand firm, then I will do a great work in your life. In Exodus chapter 14, you can look with me in verse 13. It says, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. Now you got to think of the impression that that would have placed on the hearts and minds of the people. For so many years, they had been oppressed by this army. For so long, they were powerless to stand up against such a great and vast army. And now, literally, they have to one side of them the Great Red Sea, and to the other side of them that very army bearing down upon them to destroy them. And instead of hearing instruction from God to run or to flee or to fight... Almost the exact opposite of what our minds would conceive of in a scenario like this, when your back's against a wall of water and your front's facing the enemy. The exact opposite that we would think would be, you know, we would think self-preservation. We would think, how am I going to get out of this? But God says to them, just stand and see. Just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Verse 14, it says, The Lord shall fight. For you and ye shall hold your peace. You shall stand still. You shall not move. You shall not have to lift up a finger against this great army. Verse 15, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. The children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them, and I will get me honor upon Pharaoh, and upon all his host, and upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. What's left off in that second verse is the host. In other words, I think it seems God left a host that could actually that could actually fall into the fear of God, and they could report back to the rest of, his, of Egypt what had taken place. But regardless of all that, God says very plainly, look, I behold, I will do it. I behold, I will be the one that causes you to be delivered. I behold, I will be the one that fights for you. I behold, I will show you the salvation of myself. That's what God is proclaiming to his people. And he says to them, just stand. Just be still. Just be at peace. Hold your peace. Don't even say anything. Just watch and see the salvation of God come upon your life. It's the Lord's fight, especially when it comes to his own children. He will fight for them. He will fight for you. Look with me in verse... I lost my place. 22. It says, And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. So there God fulfills his promise exactly as he says. Verse 25 then, And took off their chariot wheels that they drave them heavily, so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them 
against the Egyptians. So both promises are fulfilled. Israel goes forth on dry ground. They have an easy road, don't they, through that great miracle that God provided. And Egypt, the enemy, the, 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 the great army that was against God and against his people have the hard road, don't they? Transgressors, the way of the transgressor is hard, it says in Proverbs. And you see that play out in the life of Egyptians and as well as all the hosts as well upon the chariot and the horsemen. They drive them heavily and God just pops the wheels off. Don't you think that those were fine-tuned machines? Don't you think they had prepared them as that army to go and to, to, to face any kind of terrain that might be ahead? I think it was astonishing to them. They drove them that heavy before. They'd, 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 they'd faced terrain like that before. And for whatever reason, well, we know the reason, God Almighty, those things failed them that day. And they knew why. Our Horsemen were prepared. Our chariots were prepared. The only reason that we could fail today is if the Lord God fighteth for his people Israel. And that's exactly what took place. What a wonderful sight to see. And what a wonderful image we have here from scriptures in this very account. We can go back to Joshua chapter 4. Back to Joshua chapter 4. And these two events, you can put them side by side and you can go here and there and compare the scriptures. They, they highlight each other. They embellish one another. They work together very effectively. Both commands were that you would go so far and stand and see the salvation of God. And, and, and both events, God showed himself mighty. And what it did was strict fear into the hearts of the enemies of God and emboldened and grew the faith of the people of God in that same event. It's the Lord's fight, especially when it comes to his own children. And you as God's child have him at your disposal. He will fight for you. Sometimes you just get to the point where you can't fight another day. You can't move another inch. You can't press on. You want to give up. That's the best time to just stand and say, you know what, God, let me see your salvation. Let me see you do great works. In Joshua chapter 4, I'm going to go to verse 4. It says, And Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe a man. So Joshua prepared these people. And I believe was preparing these people. I believe he's grooming these men. He's preparing them to be the heads of the tribes or at least have some role in leadership there. He didn't just pick average Joe. He prepared these men in particular for the event that's about to take place. In verse 5 it says, And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. These must have been fairly substantial um, stones that he had required. It wasn't like it was you know, just a small little brick and you put it on your shoulder, you look awfully silly, I think, with something small. He wanted them to bear it on their shoulders. So the stones that were there in the place where they were standing were probably pretty big. Maybe even like the size of this pulpit. And they bore it up on their shoulder and they, and they walked out of the place where God's priests were standing. And he has these men prepared for such a time as this, instructed of God to do a God-given task. And they followed through. What was the purpose of this? Verse 6 begins to highlight, um, first the instruction and the memorial that this whole event was to, to embody and to, and to represent. Verse 6, that this may be a sign among you. What? The, the great stone that they're bringing with them to their lodging place. This ought to be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye these stones? Then ye shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. These stones, these great stones, were conversation pieces. They were to be this, this big memorial, this big item, so that children would look upon it and go, what means this? What, what mean these stones? What is the intent of these stones? Why are these here? Why are they this way? Why are they placed here? There was something peculiar about them so that when they looked upon them, it brought to mind to ask the question to their own parents, what are these? What's the intent of these? And it would then drive 
the people that were aged and had experienced this very event to tell the story again, a conversation piece, to bring about a conversation between the older and the younger of the great glory of God and what he did in this day that we're about to see. Verse 8, it says, And the children of Israel did so, as Joshua had commanded, and they took up twelve stones out of the midst of Jordan, as the Lord spake unto Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged. And then it says, And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests which bear the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there unto this day. So I read this through several times, and I'm like, what is going on here? Didn't God straightly command them in verse 3 that those 12 of each tribe were to take each one of them a stone and bring it to their lodging place? Okay, that's what happened in verse 8. I see that. Then in verse 9, it talks about how Joshua set up himself 12 stones in that same place that they had just pulled stones out of. An exchange had taken place. Twelve stones were removed and went to the lodging, and twelve stones were put back by the leader, Joshua, at this time. There was a replacement, a substitution that had taken place. What, what is this then? He says that this is, again, going to be another type unto the people of Israel. There's a swap that had taken place. They took them and they arranged them with the lodging, and then Joshua replaced those in a position where the, the, the priest's feet stood. It's going to tell you how as soon as they got out, the banks were overflowed again. So where they stood was a place where water is up some of the time and not on other times. There's, there's, a, there's a bank point, right? So if, if it was to come up this way and the river's over this way, there's a bank that takes place. And then it would probably taper up into where the people were living. So from that standpoint unto there water had overflowed its banks and come up to a certain place. And the priest stood somewhere in the midst here. And so this point where Joshua had put more stones is not always covered by water. And when it's not covered by water, there they would lie. And the Bible records that they are there unto this day. Now, is that just the time that, that um, you know, Joshua wrote this book or whoever recorded this book um, had written it? They're there unto this day. Or are they still there unto this day? I, I don't know. I would assume it's even un, unto this day, that somewhere over there in the Middle East, there's still 12 stones in the place where the Jordan would overflow its banks, but sometimes it doesn't, and these things are exposed. I've never been there. I, I can't dogmatically say they're still there, but I like to believe by faith that they're still there unto this day, because the Bible says they are there unto this day, and here I am standing in this day, and I can just embrace that and take that promise, and God will tell me if I'm right or wrong one day, and maybe he'll show me that. So... Stones are removed, placed where the lodging. Stones are put back, placed in a place where when the, when, the, when the bank is low, you'll be able to see them. When it's high, you won't be able to see them. Exactly where the priest stood on that day. Verse 10, it says, For the priests which bear the ark stood in the midst of Jordan, and watch this, until everything was finished, that the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto the people. According to all that Moses commanded Joshua, and the people hasted and passed over. So I love this. There's a few things you can grab from a verse like this, is that the priest stood there until everything was finished. So God said, stand and see the salvation of God. And the priest had in their mind that God was going to fulfill all of the things that Joshua had commanded them, and also that he was going to fulfill all of the things which Moses had commanded Joshua. And so they stood and they waited until such a time as everything was finished. That gives me a practical illustration that don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit when you suddenly think that God has done enough, that he's finished with his miracles. Remind yourself of certain promises of God and continue to stand in those promises until he's fulfilled them all. It gives us an idea of diligence when it comes to prayer. Sometimes we pray and we pray and we pray and God starts to work miracles and then we kind of give up in prayer because we see some progress in that area. No, don't give up. Stand there in that same place that God has you until everything is finished. Be diligent in this. Don't quit. Don't give up. The next thing that we see here is that the people hasted. Now, while they weren't quitting and they weren't 
and, and they weren't going to give up on waiting on God. They also didn't just delay to do what God had said for them. When they went across that, that and saw that miracle, it wasn't just a sightseeing excursion. They weren't stopping to see fishes on the walls of, of water, and they weren't, they weren't kind of enjoying the, the, the journey and, you know, spending some time in the sun and chatting one with another. Well, the Bible says that they, that they tarried not. They, they, they kept moving. They hasted and passed over. So the priests are standing to see the salvation of God. The people are partakers of that same miracle, but they didn't delay. They didn't tarry. They hasted and they fulfilled what God had planned for them, and they continued to pass over. Verse 11, it says, And it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over, that the ark of the Lord passed over in the presence of the people. And so once God had finished all of his great work, which he promised once he, all the people had passed over, as he said would come to pass, right there it says it again, And it came to pass. As they passed over, the ark of the Lord was was given leave to basically come up out of that same place where they stood in the presence of all the people. We can continue on in verse 12, and it says, And the children of Reuben, and the children of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh, passed over armed before the children of Israel, as Moses spake unto them. About 40,000 prepared for war, passed over before the Lord unto battle to the plains of of Jericho. So even as they had said they would do to Moses, they also fell, followed through with their promise to Joshua back in chapter 1, and they fulfilled exactly what they had said. They left part of their livestock and their people and, and their, their wives and their sons and maybe some people for defense back on this side of Jordan, and 40,000 of them prepared for war and, and armed and ready went to the battle at the other side in the plains of Jericho. They fulfilled exactly what, what um, they had basically pledged before God to Moses and to Joshua. So I'm, uh, you got to commend them for this, right? They, they basically had leisure and they had everything they wanted. They, they had basically the, the, the prime pick of the land, what they thought was the best. They're like, this is perfect for us. And they could have easily just relaxed and, and let their brethren go and of course that would have been a great sin but they fell through they fell through followed through sorry reuben gad half the tribe of manasseh went to battle as they had promised verse 14 we just saw the people following through with their promise and we're going to continue to see god following through with his promise verse 14 it says on that day the lord magnified joshua in the sight of all Israel. And they feared him as they feared Moses all the days of his life. And that's from chapter 3 and verse 7, where God says, The Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with thee, so sorry, as I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. And the people fear Moses even as they fear. If, if they fear Joshua, even as they feared Moses, all the days of his life. And so God promised that would take place. And sure enough, as it always does, God fulfilled his promise. we got to believe that God fulfills promises. And I love a book like this because you literally see promise, answer, promise, fulfilled, promise, fulfilled. And it's not like we have to, we have to wait scores of time, like some of the promises of God, right? Um, you know, Genesis 3, he shall bruise thy head, and, or he shall, yeah, he, the, the serpent's head would be, would be destroyed, and, and the heel of the Son of Man would be bruised. Well, it took, like, thousands of years for that to be fulfilled, right, in Christ when he came. These promises, just, just rapid fire. God promises, it's fulfilled. God promises, it's fulfilled. And you know what? We have both types of promises in our lives. There's some that will be fulfilled afar off, you know, I'll be sinless. I'll stand in glory. That, that's, that's after I die or after I'm, I'm, I'm caught up together to, with the Lord and his people in the air. Whatever way I leave this life, that's when that will be fulfilled. But then there's also promises that are just day by day, moment by moment, week by week. His care, his provision, his love for me. I, I can embrace all those promises today. So again, when you read this, you can simply take something like Joshua being told that he would be elevated in the sight of all Israel 
And then a chapter later, the promise is made. And you can say, wow, God, I love that you fulfill promises like that. I pray, God, that you would continue to fill promises like that in my own life. I'm thankful for it. And you can just, you can just meditate through the scriptures in that way as you see God's glory unveiled before you. Verse 15, we'll continue on. And it says, And the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Command the priests that bear the ark of the testimony that they come up out of Jordan... Joshua therefore commanded the priest, saying, Come ye up out of Jordan. So I talked briefly about how God promises and then it's fulfilled, and it's kind of this instantaneous change. But you notice how Joshua's interaction toward God is, is kind of in the same fashion. God speaks and commands in verse 16. In verse 17, Joshua therefore commanded. <laughs> you know, God says, Hey, go and do this, and Joshua does it. So if you want God to be in your life, fulfilling promises moment by moment, you got to be in, in God's life, you know, in, in what he has for you, fulfilling his commands moment by moment, even as he gives them. We have to kind of be in that same, same give and take relationship with God. He commands, we obey, he blesses as he promises. And it just happens like that. And that's what you see in, in, a, in a great man of example like Joshua in his life and, and how he walked and worked before God. Miracles are, are fulfilled and, and promises are fulfilled. But Joshua is also diligent and hasty to follow through with what God is commanding him immediately, instantaneously. As soon as God says, command the priest, Joshua therefore commands the priest. Look at verse 18. It says, and it came to pass when the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord were come up out of the midst of Jordan and the soles of the priest's feet were lifted up unto the dry land that the waters of the Jordan returned unto her place and flowed over all his banks as they did before. So the state that the banks were before the miracle has just been returned. Do you see that? As they did before is the last four words of that verse, verse 18. So all evidence of that miracle taking place is essentially gone at that point the natural state is returned the only evidence that would have taken place and been seen is that 12 rocks were removed and set up in the place where they had lodged for that time but then joshua also took 12 rocks and put them back there so maybe to somebody that was just a bystander they might not even notice what had taken place the miracle and everything that had happened is completely gone and void of any tangible evidence. Think about it. Even the rocks that Joshua put down are now overflowed with water again. You can't even see them unless you were to receive that same type of miracle as God had given to the priest where you walk in and he removes the water and then you can see it. No one's going to see it. No one's going to recognize it. No one's going to just come up and see evidence of a miracle taking place. The only acknowledgement that had, it had even occurred, first and foremost, the scriptures that we have, 100% true, and we can read them and believe them, but also that, witnesses. Witnesses are the only hope of this miracle being recorded, this miracle being registered, written, regarded by anyone. The witnesses who came forth and testified of it. And it's interesting, even in the the state of our world. How often do you see a great miracle of God? And you go and tell somebody, God had did this great work, and they'll look and I don't see any evidence. That didn't happen. I don't believe you, but for the testimony that came out of your mouth. Think of one, salvation. Positionally, you have a perfect man dwelling in you, and your home is in Christ. No one can see that. There are no outward signs of my salvation. I might do things good more than i did before there's a reformation perhaps that took place but lots of people do that all the time a is an example right i quit drinking you don't have to be saved to quit drinking you don't have to be saved to quit smoking there is no outward sign of the inward change that god made to me we take baptism and we allow for that to be the outward sign of the inward change and we go through that ritual buried with the likeness of his death and raised to walk in newness of life and that's fine and good but even if somebody is baptized, you can't look upon them and know for sure that person is saved. Do you see that outward sign? Somebody's just going to say, well, they're, they're just wet. And then when they dry off, 
They're no longer wet. There is no sign of the miracle that had just taken place because everything is restored to normal. And this happens all the time in our lives. I, 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 think, of, I think of the miracle of, of, of Caleb being born, right? Wife's told by, by scores of doctors, specialists in the field, that you are barren, you will never bear. If you do conceive, that child will die. There will not be a hospitable home for that child to be raised up for nine months. He will not make it. Give up. You might as well give a, get a hysterectomy for, the, for the, the plague that is in your inwards and the problem that is there, and it's causing you so much health concerns. It, your, your womb is the problem. Remove that thing because it's useless anyways. You'll never have a child. Give up. Scores of doctors had said that, and here is Caleb. But all I have to show that is the testimony that I just gave you. Everything's returned to normal. There's a child here, and people can say, Oh, yes, I see the child was here, and I understand your testimony of the barren womb. Okay, that's great. But they're not necessarily going to acknowledge the miracle just on the, 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 the fact that there's a child here. And we had a similar experience with Micaiah. One, two, three children, not lost, but given up to glory in the, in the time span between the two children. And at our last hope, at our last ditch effort, we did what the Bible says we should have probably done first, is that we, we went to, according to James 5, to a pastor, to a congregation, and we asked them that they would pray over us, anointing us with oil, and they did, and the time of life passed, and they asked humbly before God, everything has been done that we can think of on this side of the sun. Everything under the sun has been done to give this family a child, but to ask you of it, the miracle takes place. The time of life, one year happens, the child is born, and a miracle takes place. But again, there is no evidence of the fact that that couldn't just happen naturally. There's no evidence of the miracle that has taken place. And sometimes when you bring these things, especially to unbelievers, especially to lost people, they just say, oh, well, that's lovely. That's great. I'm, I'm happy that that luckily happened to you, or whatever they want to call it or explain it. But I know because I was witness to it, because I walked there, and because I saw it, I, I walked and I stood on dry ground and I saw the salvation of God. I know that there was a miracle that took place in both of these events, regardless of what the world thinks of them. And the same is true of these people here in Israel. They don't point necessarily to the rock and say, well, this is the miracle that it takes. They don't have necessarily a, a stanchion or a standard or a picture or an evidence of what had taken place. All they have is the own testimony of their own words and what they can tell people. I was there and I saw this. And this is the thing that is used to move men. Look, we're to go forth in our Christian life with two things. The law and our testimony. That is how we persuade men. We bring them to the law. We show them, this is your schoolmaster. Do you know what it shows you? Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not bear false witness. If you've committed any of these atrocities, if you've broken the law of God, you bring them to God and you say, look, you are guilty before him. What sayest thou? What are you going to say to these things? And they're condemned by the law. They're taught the law is their schoolmaster, and that's to bring them to Christ. And the other thing that we have at our disposal is our very testimony. Again, nobody's going to see the evidence of my salvation necessarily, but I can certainly tell the story. And I love to tell the story of things, unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. Tell the story, tell the story, tell the story. And we have those two things at our disposal when it comes to the witness of Christ. And that's exactly what these had. Do you know what else they had? A conversation piece. And don't we do the same thing? Don't we try to put before people, whether they're little children, whether they're relatives, whether they're family members, whether they're just somebody we run into, don't we like to put before them a conversation piece? Even as those stones were laid there, hey, would you like to check out some YouTube videos? Hey, would you like to... Would you like to come and visit our church? A conversation piece, something to break the ice is all that they had. They had something to break the ice. They had the law and they had their own testimony of the events that God had brought into their lives. And that's what, exactly what you're going to see play out here as you read down verse 19. 
first thing we see is the law being taught. It says, verse 19, the people came up out of Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal in the east border of Jericho. And those 12 stones which they took out of Jordan, and again, there's no evidence that that came out of Jordan. They're just 12 stones that are sitting in a particular place, in a peculiar way, perhaps. Those 12 stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, so here's the whole point of the stones that were removed from the river. When your children ask, when your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what mean these stones? Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until they were gone over. Deuteronomy chapter 6 talks about this ministry of teaching the children when they are provoked to ask questions, but also teaching the children always. Deuteronomy chapter 6, quickly I'll read from verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shall talk with them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And so they are now in Joshua chapter 4, fulfilling the command to teach their children all the time. It's just now God has given them a little aid. He's given them a talking point. He's given them an item that will provoke the people to wonder and to ask their parents, what is this thing? And then they simply transfer over and transition into giving a testimony and then showing the law of God. They ought to have done it all the time unprovoked, but this helps. We ought to do it all the time unprovoked and without a visual aid, but this helps, doesn't it? Doesn't it help to have something to pass somebody? Hey, can you check this out when you have a chance? Here's an invite to our church, but most important is what's contained on the back. And if you just take a picture of that link, it'll take you to a gospel presentation so that you can know for sure you're on to he- your way to heaven when you die. And it's a way to provoke the conversation, and it's a good tool. And this is the exact same thing I believe God is here giving to his people. Here's the gospel tract of sorts. They're giant stones. <laughs> They're arranged in different ways, but the end goal was the same, to start a conversation of who God is and what he has done. We ought to always be looking for opportunities to talk to people about who God is and what he has done. Why? Verse 24 of Joshua chapter 4. That all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, and that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. Twofold. God wants us to always be telling the story, always teaching the law, always taking opportunities to testify of what God has done in saving us and in performing miracles in our lives and in in, in interacting in our world and to doing great and glorious things for two reasons. One, that all the people of the earth might know his hand, his mighty hand, his stretched out arm, and that you personally might fear God. A great way to stay in the fear and reverence of God is to always bring to remembrance the things that he has done in your life. And a great way to bring remembrance into the things that he has done in your life is to talk about them, is to tell people about them, is to bring them to other people and to show them the great and wonderful things that God has done in your life and in the lives of others. And so here again, a miracle took place and there's no evidence but the testimony of the people that were there. And it is their job then to bring that testimony of the miracle that took place. Do you know why God does miracles in your life? Not so you can sit at home and go, wow, that was wonderful. God paid that bill. That's great. No, that's not just to help you. In fact, that's probably the least of God's concerns. He helps his children by default. That's not some great and marvelous thing that God would fulfill promises in your life. That's That's not the miracle. 
The miracle is that God interacts, fulfills promises in your life so that you can take what he has done and glorify him to others by telling them what he has done. That's why God does great things in your life, not just to benefit you, though that's a wonderful byproduct of his interaction and his miracles, right? It's great that God did great things for me, but what am I doing with that? I need to share it with others. And so I take the testimony of Caleb and I tell it to others. I take, I take the video that my, my pastor friends said and, and made of that, and what happened, and I, and I share it with even lost people and say, look what God has done. And they'll receive it like they receive it, but ultimately, who cares how they receive it? I've done with it what I was supposed to do, and that is to tell it, to show it, to, to make people see the wonderful grace of God in his mighty hand so that I might fear him more and perhaps others will fear him as well. That's why God works in your life and that's what God wants you to do with the workings that he does in your life. Stand and see the salvation of God and then go tell about it. Go talk about it. Break into that conversation any way you can. That's our duty here. And it's, a, and it's a blessed responsibility, right? It's, it's not a burdensome yoke. It'll help you, and it'll soften your heart, and it'll encourage God to want to do more in your life. Here's another area of, of, of commandment. God says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And just as he said to Joshua, command the priests that bear the ark. Joshua therefore commanded the priests. He says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Joshua, therefore, went and preached the gospel. That's what I need to focus on. Go and do, and then allow God to just be like, I can't keep up. i got to just keep giving this brother, this sister, this child of mine. i got to keep giving them miracles, because every time I give them a miracle, they use it to glorify me, and their deed is done, and their responsibility is fulfilled. So I'm just going to keep piling on the miracles so that I keep getting glory. That's what God wants to do in us. Glorify himself. Glorify himself. Remember, that's the whole reason why he glorified Joshua, so that Joshua could stand before the people and say, God's about to glorify himself, people! And then they saw it. And then they're like, wow! And then the same thing happens. Again, Joshua gets another miracle. He says, look what he's going to do! And then he does it. And then he, and he, he obeys, and then God blesses, and he obeys, and God blesses. And, and, and God, it seems like, just can't keep up pouring out blessings into Joshua's life and, and, and magnifying Joshua even as he receives glory from himself. He wants to magnify you and also receive glory unto himself as a result. That's the blessed walk of a Christian and that, that's a wonderful thing and a wonderful relationship to have with your Savior when, when he can't stop magnifying you and himself for all the glory that he's receiving. I thank you, Father, for this word. I thank you,